Live from Juneau, KTO Public Media presents special gavel Alaska coverage of Senator Dan Sullivan's annual address to the Alaska Legislature. I'm Jeremy Shea. Senator Sullivan will be headed into the chambers of the Alaska House of Representatives shortly to deliver his annual speech. You can see the members of the House and Senate getting together in the House chambers in the Capitol on television if you're following us, 360 North. The legislature's had a tradition of inviting the congressional delegation in to deliver an address while they're in session. They jointly convened this morning to hear from Senator Sullivan. They heard from Alaska's senior senator, Lisa Murkowski, earlier this week. After the speech, Sullivan plans to take a few questions from state lawmakers at the podium. Reporter Liz Ruskin covers Senator Sullivan as Alaska Public Media's correspondent in Washington, D.C., We talked earlier this week about this upcoming address and some context on Sullivan's areas of expertise. Will the House please come to order? Let's listen in on the House getting together first. With the provisions of Uniform Rule 51, I turn the gavel over to the President of the Senate, the Honorable Kathy Giesel. Will the joint session please come to order for the purpose of an address by Senator Dan Sullivan? Madam Majority Leader. Madam President, I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call of the Senate be waived and all members be shown as present. Without objection, the roll call of the Senate will be waived and all members shown as present. Mr. Majority Leader. Madam President, I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call of the House be waived and all members shown as present. With seeing no objection, the roll call of the House will be waived and all members shown as present. Will Senator Bishop and Representative Revac please escort Senator Sullivan to the joint session? While we're standing by, here's a quick bit of context from Liz Ruskin, Alaska Public Media's Washington, D.C. correspondent. He's really trying to make a name for himself in military issues and, to some extent, international relations. He, of course, used to work for the State Department in the Bush administration, so he seems very comfortable talking. Alaska, the Honorable Dan Sullivan. Well, good afternoon, everybody. President Giesel, Speaker Edgman, members of the House and Senate from the great state of Alaska. Thank you for inviting me back to speak. Thanks to each of you, each member of the legislature and your staffs for your great service to our state. It's great to be home, back home in this historic chamber. I want to first introduce uh, a lot of my leadership team is here in the chamber uh, with me. They do a great job for our state. I think you know a lot of them. Uh, Eric Elam, my legislative director, my senior advisor, Amanda Coyne. So if you don't like this speech, you can blame Amanda. No, she does a great job. Um, Renee Reeve, my state director. Dana Herndon, who is helping me here in Juneau. My chief of staff, Larry Burton. Mike Anderson, my press secretary. I think he's one of the few people in the Capitol that actually is tall enough to look Governor Dunleavy in the eye. And, um, and of course, uh, the most important member of my leadership team, but also the most important person in my world, the love of my life, my wife, Julie, is here as well. The legislature is always so gracious. Julie always gets a standing O, and I love it. Oh, thank you. Um, and I'd also like to note who is not in the chamber today. Uh, my friend, Senator John Coghill, 
who was preparing for the funeral of his legendary father, Jack. Jack Coghill was a model for all of us. He was a veteran, a patriot, a lieutenant governor, a scrappy, old school entrepreneur who believed in his heart that we had enormous potential as long as we could develop our resources. He was also one of our state's founding fathers and a father to one of the great members of this body. He certainly will be missed, but his legend lives on through his son. How about a round of applause for the Coghills? Now, I always view my speech to the legislature as the most important speech I give all year. Don't tell anyone else that, but it's true. For one thing, it gives me a chance to greet old friends and meet new ones, all of us united in a common cause to do what we think is important and best for our state. There is a tremendous freshman class of legislators here, and I'm going to ask all of you to rise so we can give you a hand, the freshmen. It's a big group of us. You might know a couple of them used to work for me. So thanks for entering the arena, running for office. You know, I'm still in my freshman term too, Josh, so we have that in common, certainly. But this speech also provides a platform to discuss with many of our elected leaders the opportunities and challenges we face, particularly from a federal perspective. My first two addresses to the legislature, I'll admit, I was a bit worked up lamenting the Obama administration's near constant actions to delay and lock up vital economic opportunities for our citizens. My next two addresses have been more optimistic given what we've been able to achieve in the Congress with the new administration that have been focusing on how to unlock Alaska's economic potential. So looking ahead, we have another power shift in Washington, D.C. with a new House majority and a new speaker. Many of the new members in the House don't know much about Alaska, our size, our unique cultures, our challenges, our wonderful people, and these House members, these new House members, haven't had to yet grapple with the Dean of the House, Congressman Young, but they will, we know that. But it's not just new members in the House or in the Senate. Uh, in my four years in the Senate, I certainly have come to realize one of the most, if not the most important jobs that I have is educating my colleagues about our great state, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Now, of course, this is not a new challenge. In 1919, Alaska's territorial governor, Thomas Riggs, spoke about the lack of knowledge about our state by most people in the country, but in particular people in Washington, D.C. He said, quote, to them, Alaska is a country peopled by desperados. Now, personally, I'd prefer tough, hardworking patriots to desperados, but you get the point. It's still an issue today. So where are we with the new Congress? We got through the partial government shutdown, which certainly wasn't a great start to the new Congress and move right to the President's State of the Union. The State of the Union, as all of you know, is a uniquely American event, and one that every year I try to bring an Alaskan to, to witness. This year, I brought Doug Tansey from Fairbanks. Doug is an Alaska Native leader, a labor leader, and an advocate for hardworking Alaskan families. President Trump's speech highlighted one of the areas that I'm particularly focused on, the economy. Because of policies like cutting taxes on middle class families and small businesses, getting rid of job killing regulations and unleashing the promise of American energy production, the US economy in the lower 48 is firing on all cylinders. With very strong economic growth, the unemployment rate is at a 50 year low and wages after almost 20 years, are finally starting to rise. As we all know, good jobs and robust economies are essential foundations for strong communities and strong families. Jobs create wealth and dignity and self-worth and a sense of purpose 
and pride that comes from earned success. And I think as everybody here also knows, the best social program always will be a good paying job for our citizens. I want to compliment President Giesel, Senator Giesel, on the great work she has been doing, highlighting how resource development in our state correlates not only to good jobs, but actually higher life expectancy. Few measures of success are more important than that, living longer. Thank you, Madam So during the State of the Union, I have to admit, I felt the little sense of frustration that while the President was talking about an economy that is booming, we are not yet booming. Not yet, at least. And I know these are tense times for you and for our state as we're grappling with shrinking budgets, but I'm optimistic that by continuing to, to enact good policies at the federal level and bringing investment dollars home to Alaska, the economic dynamism and job growth that we are seeing in the lower 48 will hopefully be coming our way soon. So let me provide a few reasons why I think that's going to happen and why I'm optimistic about that. First, on resource development. America is now the number one producer of oil and gas and renewables in the world. That's a big, big deal. And as former Secretary of Interior Ryan Zinke has repeatedly said, America's energy dominance, which is beginning to happen, has to run through Alaska. It has to run through Alaska. And I believe that's beginning to happen. The North Slope energy renaissance is real. And our state's long recession looks as if it's ended at the drill bit on the North Slope. The number of exploration wells and production rigs working on the North Slope this winter should reach a record that we haven't seen in over two decades. And for the first time in four years, in four years uh, employment in the oil fields on the North Slope is actually increasing. The state also had just one of its strongest North Slope lease sales in recent history, and the federal government with leaders like Assistant Secretary of Interior Joe Balash is efficient, efficiently permitting federal developments and state developments in the NPRA in the Offshore Liberty Project. And then, of course, there's ANWR. After my speech here two years ago, Speaker Edgman pre presented me with a resolution from all of you from the Alaska legislature that has said, in essence, let's go get this done. Let's open the 1002 area for the benefit of Alaska and America. And that's what we did. That's what we did. All of us working together, Democrats and Republicans, a 40-year effort, many, many in this body had been working on this for years. We got that done. So now we have to stand united in the next step, a successful ANWR lease sale that we hope will occur this year. There are many powerful outside special interests that are already working to sabotage this lease sale. So here's my request to all of you. In your meetings with American energy executives who come through Juno, strongly encourage them to bid in the upcoming ANWR lease sale for our state's sake and for the country's sake. Another reason for optimism is just like energy in America, the US military is also making a comeback after previous Pentagon budgets that cut spending by almost 25%. And nowhere is this rebuilding of our military been more important and more impressive than in the great state of Alaska. In just the past three and a half years, Senator Murkowski, Congressman Young, and I have been able to secure over $1.3 billion in military construction for our state, including the F-35s to Isleson and a new missile field at Fort Greeley. Now, we know this is good for America's national security, but it's also good for Alaskan workers and their families. Hundreds, if not thousands of jobs, good paying jobs, are connected to this military construction. And as chairman of the Armed Services Subcommittee in charge of readiness and military construction for the Senate, 
I am confident that this Alaska military buildup is going to continue. This past summer, I hosted the secretaries of the Air Force, and the Navy, and the Army, and the Commandant of the Coast Guard, and the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Mattis, who all came up at different times to Alaska to see our great state. And what's amazing, and you guys all know this, is that we sell ourselves. When you bring people here, leaders here, we sell ourselves. Being on the ground in the most strategic place in the world makes an impression. So too, I should note, does having a beer at the Board of Trade in Nome, <laughs> which I did, <laughs> which I did with the Secretary of the Navy, and which might be the reason he re recently announced the need for a strategic Arctic port in Western Alaska. <laughs> now, importantly, this military buildup also extends to the Coast Guard. The brave men and women of our Coast Guard ri risk their lives every single day for us, but in no state more than they do in the great state of Alaska. How about a round of applause for these unsung heroes? As chairman of the subcommittee in charge of the Coast Guard, we are undertaking a major recapitalization of the Coast Guard fleet that includes more ships and more aircraft coming to Alaska. Last April, the Commandant of the Coast Guard announced its new force laydown for our state. Four more fast response cutters, these are very large ships, are being built and slated for Alaska. These FRCs will be home ported in Kodiak, two of them, one in Seward, one in Sitka, and two previously commissioned FRCs will remain stationed in Ketchikan. Additionally, Petersburg and Juneau will be, will be receiving additional large Coast Guard patrol boats. So just last week, Congress approved an appropriation, and this is the beginning, of $53 million for the infrastructure to support these new Alaska vessels, giving many of our Southeast communities significant investment in infrastructure and housing that will support our great Coast Guard as we build up in Alaska. <laughs> Further, at long last, the talk is over, at long last, we are making real progress on icebreakers. In this past year's defense bill, I secured a provision that authorized the scheduled purchase of six polar class icebreakers. <laughs> and just this past week, again with the appropriations bill the president just signed, Senator Murkowski played a critical role in the appropriation of close to $700 million for building what will be the first of many of these polar security cutters. So it is finally, finally happening on the issue of icebreakers. So I, I want to let all of you know you, you can believe that we are just beginning, just beginning to make sure the Coast Guard is going to be very strong, very present in Alaska, and we've made some good progress on that. Of course, it's not just energy and resources and the military and the Coast Guard that drive our economy, it's tourism. It's federal infrastructure dollars. It's our fisheries. In all of these areas, the trend lines for Alaska point to a stronger Alaska economy. Our state has the most sustainable and abundant fisheries in the world that support tens of thousands of jobs throughout our state. We've had some recent successes in increasing market opportunities for our world-class wild products. Let me just give you one example. We were able to include a provision in the most recent Farm Bill that mandates that only domestically landed and processed fish be included in the National School Lunch Program. That's a big deal. This is a huge market for our fish, huge. Yet unbelievably, there was a loophole in the previous program that allowed Russian caught pollock that's sent to China injected with phosphates, sent back to the U.S. 
to be allowed into the school lunch program paid by federal dollars. Not only was this bad for our fishing industry, this chemical-laden, twice-frozen fish was served to American kids all across the country, and it literally turned off a generation of Americans on seafood because it tasted so bad. <laughs> so in the Farm Bill just a couple months ago, we were able to close that loophole, create a whole new, very big market for our fish, and now American kids will be eating the best fish on the planet, wild-caught Alaskan fish. So the final reason I'm optimistic about the direction of the economy is that we do have an administration in Washington that wants to help us. And say what you want about President Trump. Like him? Don't like him? And we know there's a lot of people on both sides of that equation. From the very start, his administration has shown a commitment to Alaska's success, particularly our economic success. And I appreciate people who are good to our people. Let me give you one very important example. Very early in the president's term, he invited Senator Murkowski and me to the Oval Office for a meeting about Alaska. It was all about Alaska. We brought maps, we brought charts, we bought, brought graphs, spread it over his desk. Secretary Zinke was there, a lot of his staff was there, and we spoke to him for over an hour about everything that all of you care about. Nothing was off the table. Anwar, the NPRA, OCS, the Tongass, our military, access to federal lands, the King Cove Road, our veterans. We even talked about the importance of our North Slope whaling communities. On almost every single one of these issues, this administration has delivered for Alaska. And they've had the help, and this is very important, of wonderful Alaskans like Joe Balash and Tara Sweeney and Chris Oliver and Drew Pierce and senior administration officials positions looking out for Alaska's interests. Let me just mention one of these examples. The administration even backed very strongly our whaling captains from the North Slope. Some of you may have followed what happened just a few months ago but every six years, our whaling captains have to go to the International Whaling Commission and get permission to do their subsistence hunt from this very large organization, many countries of which are opposed to doing this. So we had everybody from Secretary Pompeo at the State Department on down working with us and our whaling captains to make sure we got that quota again in Brazil. And not only did we get the quota, it was the first time ever the IWC voted to automatically renew our North Slope Whalers quota. This was a huge victory that we had been working on, that many of our leaders on the North Slope had been working on for decades. They had the backing of the administration. So I know that uh, Mayor Brower from the North Slope Borough is in the gallery today, and he was in Brazil working this issue hard. Can we give him and the other North Slope whaling captains a hearty round of applause? Now, in the Marine Corps, we have a saying. It's protect what you've earned. And when it comes to the new House majority in Washington, DC, a lot of what I've just discussed as important achievements for Alaska in our economy might, might come under attack. Raising taxes on Americans, shutting down access to federal lands like Anwar or the King Cove Road, slashing defense and Coast Guard funding, and the even so-called the New Green Deal, these are the types of policies now being discussed and introduced in the House. 
And I do not think, and I think most of you would agree, are not, these are not good for Alaska. So let me assure you, Congressman Young, Senator Murkowski, and I will fight to protect what we've earned, what we've all earned here. We're going to work hard to ensure these victories for Alaska are preserved in the new Congress. But that does not mean there will not be areas of cooperation in the new Congress. In fact, I am confident that we will have the ability to build on the bipartisan successes we've already had in some important areas for our state and for our country. Let me give you a few examples of this. First, health care, which I know is a major concern for Alaskans, for all of us, particularly as budgets are being cut for public programs. Health care costs are simply unsustainable. We need to decrease costs while preserving the elements that only America's health care system can deliver. We're already making progress in this area in a bipartisan way. For example, we funded the Children's Health Insurance Program, known in Alaska as Denali Kid Care, for 10 years. It is. Yeah. That is the longest reauthorization of that important program in history. So there should be no worries about Denali Kid Care or the CHIP funding from the federal government for our kids. Let me give you another example. We expanded funding for community health centers. Last year, the funding was close to $8 billion. Guess which state has more community health centers than any state in the country? Alaska. We have 170 community health center sites across our state serving more than 113,000 Alaskans and we will continue to fund these vital centers as well. The Trump administration recently eased regulations on short-term insurance plans allowing people to find a plan that is affordable that best fits their circumstances and some of you may have seen the Alaska Chamber of Commerce is coalescing with small businesses and their members throughout the state to allow them to purchase insurance under these new plans at lower rates. And recently, the Congress passed and the President signed two bills which will bring transparency and drug at, with regard to drug pricing, which, believe it or not, has been opaque for decades. And this will also help re reduce costs for Americans. Looking ahead, I think you can expect to see continuing bipartisan efforts to reduce health care costs, including, importantly, on prescription drugs. However, many of us, myself included, will oppose any so-called Medicare for All plans, which sound good, but would cost about $3 trillion a year and force upwards of 170 million Americans, two-thirds of, two of all Americans, off their private insurance into government-run health care. That's what that bill does. We need to make changes, certainly, and we will continue to do so in our health care system, but there are components of America's health care system that are very, very important and second to none. Oncology, pediatric care, some of the best hospitals and doctors and health care workers anywhere in the world, we cannot lose that by making the whole health care system run by the government. <laughs> Related to health care, this is an issue, the next issue I think unites all of us, and that's the issue of combating the opioid and addiction crisis that has plagued so many of our communities in Alaska and across the country. As all of you know, sometimes in these jobs that we have, you learn from your constituents. And this is certainly an area where I've learned a lot. We hosted a summit, I know some of you attended, in the Matsu Valley in 2016, where we brought together top federal officials from the Obama administration and state officials and elected leaders on how we get through this and what it is and how we can work together as community to address it. That meeting brought together, we, we, we had no idea if anyone was going to show up to that. We ended up having over 500 Alaskans come to the Matsu College that day. 
And when people said to me, wow, Senator, that looked like a successful meeting, my answer was that wasn't a successful meeting, that was a call for help. And yet, what's still happening in the country is nothing short of just carnage. Last year, 72,000 Americans died of drug overdoses, mostly opioids and heroin, 72,000, which is a number that's staggering. And you certainly have my commitment to work with all of you in a continued partnership on this issue. We've passed two very comprehensive bills with funding for, with billions of dollars to provide treatment and prevention and to strengthen enforcement efforts. The good news is there's indications that the numbers in Alaska are starting to decline in terms of overdoses, but we know that we have a long, long way to go on that important issue. Another area that I want to mention in terms of a bipartisan approach in the Congress involves the crisis, and it is a crisis, of pollution in our oceans. Two years ago, I teamed up with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat from Rhode Island, to try to do something about this ocean debris crisis that's particularly affecting Alaska. Now, he and I, for those of you who know the Senator, make an odd team. He is from a very small state, and our state is very big, 490 times size to his, the size of his state, which I frequently remind him. He's also very, very liberal, and well, I'm not. And in October, however, after a lot of hard work, I was proud to accompany Senator Whitehouse and Julie to the White House for an Oval Office signing of our bill, the Save Our Seas Act, which he and I co-authored and which will help start to address this issue of hundreds of thousands of tons of debris estimated to be floating in the ocean's surface in a manner that not only impacts our state and coastal communities, but the sustainability of our world-class fisheries. Now, it was the first time that Senator Whitehouse had met President Trump. It was a little bit of an interesting meeting. And when I was on the floor, I, we had worked hard to make sure, I wanted to make sure he came to the signing. So when I was on the floor in a discussion with him, on the Senate floor, I said, look, we're going to get you in there. You've worked so hard on this, but I, I just want your assurances. Are you going to behave when you get into the Oval Office? And he said, yeah, I'm going to behave. And then he said, will the president behave? <laughs> and then I said, I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, um, everybody ended up getting, very, getting along great at the signing. Uh, which was actually carried live on CNN and Fox News. And in this Congress, Senator Whitehouse and I and other colleagues are getting ready to introduce Save Our Seas 2.0, which would build on the efforts that we just had. And let me just say one thing about this. This is actually an environmental problem, which is a big one, especially for us, that we actually can solve. Five countries in Asia, 10 rivers account for the estimates vary, but up to 75% of the plastics that are in the entire ocean. And right now, there is full alignment from all the key stakeholder groups, Democrats, Republicans, the Trump administration, the environmental community, and importantly, industry. Senator Whitehouse and I recently had a press conference with some of the top CEOs in the country from the chemical industry, Dow Chemical and others, and they have already put together a coalition called the Alliance to Pledge, the Alliance for Ocean-Free Debris. They've already pledged $1.5 billion for cleanup. And so we think that this is going to be a problem. We're going to continue to work on, but we can actually solve. <laughs> Let me mention one final area of bipartisan cooperation that I know many of you care about, all of you care about, that we will be focusing on in the new Congress. And it involves a very difficult issue to talk about, the problem of sexual assault and domestic violence in Alaska and in our nation. Let me begin this topic with a story of my, of my own with regard to 
Uh, almost 10 years ago when I was your Attorney General, I was the lead of the what was then called the R Rural Sub-Cabinet. And I traveled to a number of communities with other cabinet members, Senator Bishops here and others, we did this. In one of the meetings I had early on in this, I was with the superintendent in a community where he told me his best student, his best student, had called in and she was unable to take a test that morning. And the reason that was the case is because she had been sexually assaulted the night before, a young girl. I knew that sexual abuse was a huge problem in our state, but there was something about that particular story that broke my heart. And steeled my resolve to work on this issue. So soon, working again with all of you, we, Governor Parnell, Commissioner Masters, many in this body, launched the Choose Respect initiative. Posters, legislation, legal services, public service announcements, we all began to work on this together. And I think it's time for this body, and certainly we're gonna take it to the Congress, to re-energize this effort. We have many... We have many social problems in our state, but I count domestic violence and sexual abuse to be the most pernicious. <laughs> Women make up roughly half of our state, and the statistics show that more than half of them have experienced some kind of abuse. That's a quarter of the population of the state of Alaska. These are our sisters and our mothers and our spouses and our aunts and our daughters. These are our neighbors and friends. These are members of our staff, maybe even some members of this body. And like the opioid epidemic, this is an issue that affects all of us, all races, all income levels, all ages, and all corners of the state. It saps our creative energy, and it leaves deep, permanent scars across generations. We have such tremendous potential as a state, but we simply cannot realize it if we don't stop this. The men of Alaska don't stop this. <laughs> this problem extends throughout our nation, as we've seen over the last couple of years. So in the new Congress, we intend to take key elements of our Alaska Choose Respect initiative to the national level. Last year, I spoke about a bill that I authored called the Power Act which will provide more free legal services to victims and survivors of domestic violence throughout the country. And I'm proud to say that in se September, the Power Act was signed into law. But we have a lot more work to do. I've been working with my colleagues, again, from both sides of the aisle, on a series of bills that we're calling the Choose Respect Initiative. The initiative includes a national advertising campaign, an innovative program to issue protective orders, and a right to counsel for survivors. So think about this fact. If you are a perpetrator, so somebody who has committed sexual assault or rape or stalking, and you're charged, guess what? You get a lawyer. You get a Sixth Amendment right to counsel under the US Constitution. But if you're the victim of that crime, guess what you get? You get nothing. You get nothing. So I think we should change that. So we want to get money to the states so that they can provide legal representation to these survivors. It's only fair that survivors have the same legal rights and representation that a perpetrator does. And studies show that the best way, the best way for a survivor to break out of the cycle of violence they often find themselves in is to make sure they have legal representation. So again, working together. <laughs> working together with all of you, with members of both parties, the federal government, the states, the communities, 
we need to re-energize our efforts to tackle this issue. So let me conclude by talking about another reason I remain optimistic about our future. And I know all of you feel the same way, and it's the people we represent. We know that Alaskans are self-sufficient and generous. We see it all the time, most recently in the aftermath of the earthquake, where everyone pitched in. That was the most dramatic example we've had for a while. But every day, neighbors across the state, your constituents and mine, are spending time and energy and efforts helping others, making their communities better and our state stronger. Nearly every week when we've been in session for the last three years, I go to the Senate floor to highlight one of these Alaskans in a speech that I give, usually Thursday afternoon, called the Alaskan of the Week. And it's one of the ways I try to educate Americans about Alaskans. And it's actually one of the best things I do all week. It's interesting, the DC reporters and the Senate pages actually kind of enjoy it. I get a lot of questions in the halls, particularly on Thursday afternoon when they see me going down there, about, hey, Senator, who's the Alaskan of the week this week? So let me tell you about them, the Alaskans of the week. They're as old as 100. We had one from Fairbanks just a couple weeks ago who was 100. And they're as young as eight. Actually, a local Juno boy was one about two weeks ago who was eight. They come from far, the far north, Right here in Southeast, they live surrounded by our beautiful tundra, by the churning seas, by the mountains, by the rainforests. They are librarians and artists, former governors, healthcare workers, whalers, counselors, pastors, lawyers, students, teachers, every profession imaginable. Some of, um, some of them have retired already. Some of them have not even started grade school. <laughs> They reflect our state in all its wonderful diversity. But they all have one thing in common, and that is to use whatever skills they have to help their community and their state and their country. And these people all live in your districts. And I can imagine you're very proud of them, like I am. Let me give you, <laughs> let me just give you a few examples. Gene Follett from Moose Pass spends hours nearly every single day cleaning up trash from the side of the Seward and Sterling highways. She estimates that she covers around 50 miles of highway every season. Jean is in your district, Senator Machiki and Representative Carpenter. Joyce McCombs is in Delta Junction, has spent nearly 32 years keeping the library there going and keeping it one of the best libraries in the state. It's a community living room, Joyce calls it, a much needed place for people to get out of the cold and be with each other. Senator Schauer, Representative Rauscher, she's one of yours. Alex Anna Salmon of Iggy Agik, who graduated cum laude from Dartmouth, came back to her home to better her community, to work on sustainable energy and food projects. Senator Huffman, Speaker Edgman, she's one of your constituents. And Senator Bert Stedman and Representative Ortiz, what an honor you have to represent Saul Atkinson of Metlakatla. Saul served as one of the first ever US Navy SEALs, SEAL Team One, the first one. Three tours in Vietnam, went on to train 48 astronauts, including Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Jim Lavelle, just to name a few. All of this, and yet he still came home, was mayor, spent his years helping veterans get, to get the benefits they had earned. That's one of our constituents here, Senator Stedman, Representative Ortiz. I could go on and on and on. All across the state, our Alaskans of the week are helping people find a pet to love, making meals for the sick, starting and contributing to nonprofits, writing beautiful prose, establishing iconic businesses, working their whole lives to do what's right by our state and our country and our communities. 
They are constant reminders that no matter how heated the conversations may get in this building and in DC, that we're all in this together. We work for them with their consent. Sometimes I think it's easy to forget that government doesn't control everything, doesn't control empathy, it doesn't control kindness and generosity. That's what people do. That's their job. And if we do our job well, the elected representatives of our great state, if we can get along where we can, fight for what we believe in, compromise when necessary, they, these great constituents of ours, will be free to do their jobs as well. That is the real reason I have so much optimism about our future, and I think most of you, if not all of you, share it. So thank you for letting me address you again, and God bless the great state of Alaska. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Sullivan yes. has agreed yes. to take a couple questions. Yes. I know Senator Machiki has one. Thank you, Senator, for being here. I, I just have to say you've had a vision for growing the pie in Alaska financially, and it's a dream we can't lose sight of. You've done so much to open up um, exploration. You've done so much to improve our policies, and we're very grateful for that. We're proud of you. But that brings us back. I, 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 we have a tendency to focus on our fiscal crisis instead of forgetting the dream of a, th of a thriving Alaska, which, which we can't do. But in that fiscal struggle, um, I'm, I asked this question of Senator Murkowski. I'm going to ask it of you. Uh, an FMAP dollar in New York doesn't as go as quite as far as an FMAP dollar in Alaska. And we need some relief. Um, Mr. Senator, um, can you, are you working on a formulaic adjustment for low population density states like Alaska where there are distance problems or geographical problems that bring up the cost of health care here? Um, are you working on relief for an adjustment that would bring down our cost of providing health care through Medicaid in our great state? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Machiki, for that question, and thank you for your great service. I've really enjoyed my time working with you in my capacity here in the Cabinet and then in this job. Uh, the answer to your question is yes, yes, and yes. And uh, so uh, this, again, was an issue when I got to the Senate that I started to realize in meetings and discussions with our fellow Alaskans and looking around. but. Um, the federal match for Medicaid is uh, established by a really, it's a rather simple formula. It's a per capita income formula. And believe it or not, our state, which has the highest health care costs in the country, has the lowest FMAP match of any state in America. Okay, that just doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. So uh, for the last, boy, almost two years as we've dug into this, uh, we have worked really hard for language that would help uh, have states with uh, cost of living and health care costs that are much higher than the rest of the country be adjusted in the FMAP formula. Right now, like I said, there's states that almost have a 75-25 Fed state match. We are at 50-50. So what we did during the big uh, health care debate in 2017 is my team and I worked on that issue for uh, well over a year. And we made every member of Congress aware of it, the Trump administration aware of it, the House aware of it. And one of the things that didn't get reported a lot in the press is we were looking on health care reform. We had a commitment and then later language in uh, one of the bills, the graham Cassie bill, to fix this. Uh, CBO did a score on it, the Congressional Budget Office, and they scored this significant over 10 years, but it would have brought uh, the estimates are about 200 to 250 million additional Medicaid dollars from the feds to the state of Alaska. And I was 
fairly confident that we uh, had the votes to get it done. Um, unfortunately, uh, it didn't pan out on the uh, legislation that we were working on, I mean the broader legislation, but um, this formula would have changed our match to about a 62-38 match. So um, what we were able to do is go to members of Congress and just say, look at our costs, look at this 50-50, this is not equitable. This is not equitable. So uh, I certainly will give you my commitment, we're gonna continue to work on that. We were very close, I think I was able to convince most of the members of the Senate and the House and certainly the Trump administration that this was good policy. It would have cost the federal government more, but it certainly would have helped our state from a fiscal perspective. So we are not done with that. And uh, working with the governor's team when they're in town, I mean, what I'm gonna encourage them to do is help us make the case because it's an important issue and I think it just goes to fairness. There's no way that the state of Alaska, given our health care costs and our cost of living, should have the lowest FMAP um, match of any state in the country. It makes no sense. And it's not fair, in my view. So we're going to continue to work on it. So thank you for the question. Representative Rivak. Uh, thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Boss, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Senator Sullivan, old habits uh, <laughs> die hard. Um, I want to thank you for your efforts in making sure that our federal partners in our Department of Defense um, understand Alaska's strategic importance in our national defense. What that means to me and, and my neighbors in particular is, is uh, many of my neighbors are military, some of them 425. And so uh, there are neighbors, there are friends, and they contribute to our economy. And I know you work very tirelessly. Um, to make sure that we didn't lose our only uh, airborne infantry brigade and I and and my neighbors and I appreciate that greatly uh, you mentioned uh, bringing cabinet officials and agency um, agency uh, professionals here to Alaska to make sure they understand our unique challenges and our unique opportunities I want to thank you for that as well one that you didn't mention is I understand there was a recent trip uh, with the secretary of the VA secretary Wilkie and I uh, my question is, is, is what is it that, um, as, as you know, and, and I think everybody understands, Alaska has more veterans per capita than any other state in the nation. And, and, uh, and so I'm curious, what was, uh, what was your hopes in, as far as his takeaways from his visit here? And uh, what do you hope to accomplish in the future uh, in your committee and the VA committee? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. And uh, thanks for your service, right? Having a you know, Purple Heart recipient here in the great state of Alaska in these great chambers, I think is a, you do your colleagues an honor by uh, your sacrifice, which is real sacrifice. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, look, you mentioned that, you know, we have more vets per capita than any state in the country. And um, it shows, like I mentioned, you know, we sell ourselves. The other way we sell ourselves is when these military leaders are up here and they see how supportive Alaska is of our military, it's off the charts. And a lot of, we just kind of take it for granted because we think that's normal. Trust me, there's a lot of states where that isn't the case, where they're like, geez, we're getting more F-35s. I think the city council of Burlington, Vermont, have voted on a resolution where they didn't want the F-35s. So my view was like, well, hell, we'll take them, right? I mean, if you guys don't want them. So, uh, um, so it's actually a great, great part of our uh, state. We did have Secretary Wilkie up here. Uh, I think he's gonna do a great job. We passed last year this uh, bill called the VA Mission Act, which uh, I'm on the Veterans Affairs Committee. That's, that has a whole bunch of things in that are very specific to Alaska because we have unique challenges. But one of the things that's happening here, um, we put the, the VA leadership on some of our challenges where we didn't have enough uh, healthcare providers. So for example, out in the valley, uh, in the Matsu Valley, we went without having a doctor in the valley for almost five years. I mean, in the VA facilities there, that's outrageous. 
So uh, Wilkie has been doing a great job. And so has uh, the head of the VA, um, Dr. Ballard. As a matter of fact, Dr. Ballard, our head of our VA in Alaska. He's a veteran. Uh, he just got an award uh, uh, two weeks ago from the VA when he was in DC for the most improved, most improved healthcare services of any state in, uh, in the country. That was our VA. And what we're doing is A, we're getting more people there. So right now the Valley now at the C-Box they call them, uh, we now have three doctors. Finally, took too darn long, but we have three doctors uh, there. Um, the good news is a lot of parts of America, the veteran population is shrinking. It's not here, it's growing. And so when the secretary was out here, he was looking at areas in which we are looking to expand. And that's gonna be uh, certainly in Fairbanks. They're already, they already have uh, RFPs out there for a new building uh, in the area and then in the valley and in other parts of the state. So the Mission Act is really gonna help us provide uh, extended services to veterans who throughout our whole state where there's no uh, VA facility, but we're gonna be building up more facilities for our veterans and um, it's an important story. You know, uh, four years ago, you might remember we were trying to implement what was called the Choice Act and it was an unmitigated disaster in Alaska. Unmitigated disaster. So we keep a close eye on it. We wanna hear from all of you. Certainly the VA is not perfect, but they've made a lot of improvements and one of the ways they've made improvements under Dr. Ballard's leadership and one of the reasons he got this award is they have increased employees, including uh, doctors, providers, by I think it was close to 120 new personnel in Alaska to help us, and that's really important. So we'll continue to focus on, as you mentioned, I'm on the Veterans Affairs Committee, given how important the population is to our state. We're not 100% there yet, there's always screw ups, you know, the VA can be bureaucratic, that's for sure, but generally in Alaska, I think we're on the right trajectory, and Wilkie's leadership has uh, been important in that regard, so we're gonna keep on it. Thank you for the question. We have time for just one more question, and that'll be Representative Newman. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator. I'm glad to see we got the, I like your got the memo on the dress code. Uh, Senator, uh, welcome. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you for your Attorney General and uh, Commissioner DNR jobs. Uh, Senator, I've been looking at the problems that we have with our fiscal situation, and I think it's going to take a big swing to get out of what we're, we're the situation that we're in. I listened to Senator Murkowski and yourself talk about the icebreakers that America's going to come uh, about. Uh, I know that Canada's working on quite a few in Russia. Uh, a lot of that is for over-the-top freighter traffic. I believe they want to start using that. Um, my mind goes back to when you and I, remember I was working on gas to liquids and when the Department of Defense came to Alaska to launch their alternative fuel program, because we have so much coal and gas here, is we have an opportunity here to skate to the puck, as my friend Mike Kelly used to say, where we can be providing alternative fuels to retrofit vessels that would be using basically the next northern Panama Canal, uh, the next, next northern shipping canal, a global shipping canal that could support a port in Nome. But it would also support, you know, as DOD was very concerned about Pacific Command and Alaska's, as you mentioned, our position in the Asian Pacific arena and how important that is to strategic defense. And again, uh, with Pacific, uh, Pacific Command at Pearl Harbor, where 90% of the fuel we buy comes from countries that lob bombs at us. Um, is now the opportunity to maybe dust that off and see what we can do. Uh, it's gonna take a vision. And I, when I first approached Governor Dunley about this, because we need, the, we need the governor behind this and the bully pulpit of that position, um, Wally Hickel was remembered for water lines to the lower 48 and yeah. bridges to Siberia because he had vision. It's going to take vision to get out of Alaska's problems that we're in now. I think that, you know, when we have guys like Donald Trump and you and Lisa where you're at, um, it's now the time to dust this off and look and see where we're at. Well, look, Mark, and uh, great to see you, and thank you for your years of service, which have been phenomenal for your constituents in the state. But I, I think you're making a great point. So. 
And I think it's a really important point to kind of look beyond just, so I mentioned, so this military buildup, all right? We're doing, you know, Fort Greeley, the long range discrimination radar, it's clear. We have F-35s coming in. Um, as I like to mention, you know, we're, we're gonna have uh, over 100, what are called fifth generation fighters um, in Alaska. Those are the supersonic stealth F-22s or F-35s, 100, actually, Jay Bear, we just got another like half squadron of F-22s very recently. Um, no place in the world is going to have 100 fifth gen fighters, right? That's how strategic we are. That's how important we are. But um, to me, what we need to do is start thinking about how we leverage that for uh, other opportunities. So your point is really right on. The one thing that I've been looking at and working on. If we have all these fighters, then we're working hard to get new tankers. Um, and why aren't we doing more to produce Jet A fuel here, right? We're doing some, but we have this hub in terms of commercial uh, 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 aviation, in, uh, in terms of these new fighters, in terms of what we're working on to get new tankers, KC-46s to Alaska. And we have the resources to actually produce the fuel for all of it, as opposed to, and we import a lot of that fuel for these planes. Well, I don't think we should be doing that. So that's an area where we should look at leveraging what's coming in terms of assets. We know they're gonna be here for a very long time. We know they need fuel, we have fuel. Why aren't we looking at the opportunity of working with them to make it so we don't have to import any of that? That's one idea. The other one relates to the Coast Guard. So. You know, we have a shipbuilding facility in Ketchikan. One of the things that we're working on and we put in the Coast Guard bill that my team and I authored that Coast Guard bill, it passed last fall, but that we need, we should be looking at our shipyard in Ketchikan to be able to do major, major overhauls of these new uh, cutters that are coming. Why are we sending these to Northern California, right, for that action? It should be here. It's actually cheaper for the Coast Guard. We put a provision in the Coast Guard Authorization Act to allow that to happen. In meeting with some of the folks at Vigor recently, they are looking at the opportunity. They have a contract to do a lot of the Fort Greeley um, missile tubes. Why can't we be maybe looking at fabricating some of those in Ketchikan? So I think there's great opportunities when we know what things are coming and they're coming, looking at the next step, which is in how do we leverage that for more economic opportunities, economic growth, better jobs, and I think you're exactly right. So if you all, and I know you do, have good ideas on that kind of thing, um, we wanna work with you on it because when we have these good news stories of things coming, of resource development, of more assets, we need to not just say, great, all right, what's the next step? How do we leverage that? How do we make that even more promising for our state? So I think it's a great point. And I think, you know, on the energy side and the jet fuel side with, you know, some of the biggest fleets of fighter aircraft in the world being stationed here because we're so strategic, we need to build on it. So great question. Senator Sullivan, it was a privilege to have you. Thank you. Thank you. That was U.S. Senator Dan Sullivan's 2019 address to the Alaska Legislature, live from the state capitol in Juneau. To recap some parts of Senator Dan Sullivan's address, he connected an Alaska military buildup, federal tax changes, and opening ANWR and offshore drilling to an economic turnaround he anticipates coming to Alaska. He highlighted some of the military investments he had a Madam hand in Majority bringing Leader. to Alaska. $1.3 billion dollars over the last three years were advanced F-35 fighter jets no at Eielson Air Force Base, new missile field at Fort Greeley. The city had hosted a lot of high-level military officials in Alaska to make the case for the state's strategic importance, including having a beer with the Secretary of the Navy in Nome, who recently announced a need for a port in western Alaska. He noted $53 million in recent defense bills for additional Coast Guard vessels in Alaska and the scheduled purchase of six polar-class icebreakers. He didn't directly address the risk that President Donald Trump's recent southern border emergency declaration 
may have on funding for some of those military projects in Alaska and may redirect Alaska money to the border wall. Also, he said it's time to re-energize the Choose Respect campaign, a Parnell-era state initiative to combat domestic violence and sexual assault. is working on national legislation to give survivors of victims of those crimes legal representation. This concludes our live special coverage of Senator Dan Sullivan's 2019 address to the Alaska Legislature. This special coverage was presented by KTOO Public Media in Juneau. I'm Jeremy Shea. Thanks for joining us.